Hello, my name is Jeremy. I'm with Faithful Guardian Training Center. Today we're going to be talking about uh, the chest trauma and the anatomy associated with the chest and how they all get affected. Uh, so to start with, you need to understand what your thoracic cavity actually is uh, for us to be able to start with chest trauma. So posteriorly, so to your back, you have your thoracic uh, vertebrae and you also have your ribs. Uh, to your lateral aspects, you have your ribs, and to your anterior, you have your ribs and your sternum. Superiorly, you know, we have the thoracic inlet, uh, which is kind of where everything enters your, your esophagus, your trachea, where everything decides that it wants to enter inside your chest cavity. And inferiorly, we have our diaphragm. And understanding that, that pocket that everything makes and how it's all built up really gives us a good understanding as to when something gets injured, what's actually happening. Um, so you need to know that the thoracic cavity, you have you have 12 ribs uh, total. And so those 12 ribs there, they're all going to go down the posterior aspect of, of your thoracic cavity. So your ribs, they actually uh, correlate with your vertebrae. So we have 12 ribs, which means that we're going to have 12 vertebrae. So if you get asked how many thoracic vertebrae you have, the answer will be 12. Uh, the last two ribs that we have, rib 11 and 12, they're actually going to be considered our floating ribs. Uh, ribs 1 through 9, or I'm sorry, 1 through 10, are actually going to all correlate with the sternum, even if that means that they're connected through the uh, through the coastal cartilage. Um, so you have your, your sternum. Uh, anteriorly is you have your superior manubrium, your central sternal body, which is going to be the main brunt of, um, of your sternum. You have your supra sternal notch, uh, that's the space directly superior to the manubrium, and then you actually have your angle of Louis, which is the junction of the manubrium to the sternal body. So it's a little, it's part of the actual sternum itself. Uh, you also have our clavicles which are, those, those are S-shaped bones, and directly behind them and beneath them, we actually have our subclavian artery and our vein. Uh, and so if your clavicles get ruptured or uh, broken, uh, they can actually cause a significant amount of damage on the inside, leading to hemothorax, pneumothorax, uh, any, any, any number of issues. Um, now, you have five of the seven pairs of your ribs, uh, that they, they attach directly to the sternum via the coastal cartilage. And, um, and then you also have an intercostal space that is between each rib. Uh, now, there, there's a couple different ways that you can kind of look at that space. So uh, a lot of places they'll tell you to think about the, the ribs and the intercostal space as kind of like a bridge. And, you know, you can, uh, you have stuff that, water that flows under the bridge. What that means is that you actually have your, your nerves, your bundle of nerves, your, your arteries, your veins, they all go under the ribs. They are directly lying on the bottom side of the ribs. So what this means is that if we are attempting to perform a needle forcostomy on somebody because we're suspecting a tension pneumo or a pneumothorax or something like that, if we were to go under the rib instead of over it, we would not be entering the empty space. Uh, that's provided to us, we would actually be rupturing the um, the arteries, the vessels, and the nerves that are right there. And this could have significant complications for our patient. And it's just one of those things that uh, we need to be aware of and keep in mind. So remember, water flows under the bridge, blood flows under the rib. Uh, now, we also have our, um, our mediastinum, which is essentially going to be the middle portion of the chest. Uh, so behind that, you know, we have our heart, our great vessels, we have our esophagus, um, our trachea is a big one, uh, the main stem bronchi, and you know, you know, you also have your your vagus and your phrenic nerves. That everything really kind of lies down the center. Um, and so if you have somebody that has a pneumo mediastinum, this means that they have air building in the center of their chest. Um, and so something that you do have to worry about, you know, with the greater, uh, the higher injuries. So, for example, if you have somebody that broke their first or second rib, uh, those are very, very stout, very strong 
uh, ribs, strong bones. And so if they get ruptured or uh, damaged and where, you know, they have a break, uh, you can actually have a higher incidence of great vessel disruption, so aortic disruption. And so this can be uh, an aortic rupture. It can be a contusion. Uh, it's just one of those things that you need to be aware of. That that's a thing. Um, now, your heart is also lying directly in the mediastinum, and your heart is inferior to your ascending aorta, and it's going to lie uh, pretty much about right there about your nipple line, uh, fourth, fifth intercostal space area. And so it's composed of a couple different things. So you have your pericardium, or your pericardial sac. Uh, your pericardial sac is actually going to be the, the outermost uh, layer of everything that's going on. Now, your your pericardium, it actually is going to attach to the diaphragm and the surrounding structures to kind of help create an anchor for everything. Now, inside of that pericardial sac, you will have uh, your, your heart, okay? And so that's going to be your actual heart muscle. So as your heart is beating, contracting, is doing everything inside of that sac, um, and so an example of something that could cause damage to that area or something that would be negative to that area would be a uh, would be a pericardial tamponade, which is where you have blood or a fluid uh, leaking inside of that pericardial sac. And then what happens is as your heart continues to beat, it is releasing more fluid, it is releasing more blood into that, that fixed size container of the pericardial sac, which leaves your heart less and less room to be able to uh, to contract and relax. And so eventually it's going to get to a point where there's so much fluid, there's so, there's so much of a substance built up inside that pericardial sac that it is actually going to cause your heart to stop beating. Um, and so the fix for that is actually going to be a pericardial synthesis, which we will talk about later. Uh, now, most of your heart is actually going to be protected anteriorly by the sternum, and uh, you know you can feel that beat if you were to place your hand on somebody's chest, and right there, that about that fifth intercostal space, right there by the sternum, you'll be able to feel their heart actually beat against their chest. Um, after you, the blood leaves your left ventricle, leaves your heart, uh, it's going to enter the aortic, uh, the ascending aorta. The ascending aorta is going to be your aortic, aortic uh, arch and then after that it's going to be breaking off into all of your other vessels, uh, your subclavian, uh, your brachiocephalic, everything's just going to kind of branch off of each other. And then that's also going to go down to you have your thoracic aorta and then you eventually get into your abdominal aorta as well. Um, and your thoracic cavity, your chest cavity is going to comprise a lot of those great vessels and the closer the vessel is to the heart really the bigger it is so your aorta is the greatest vessel that we have and so if it were to get ruptured get damaged or anything like that uh, there's a very high incidence of death just from blood loss alone and what they're finding is that most traumatic deaths uh, from car crashes for example uh, where you have somebody that is in cardiac arrest on scene it's typically going to be due to uh, aortic rupture or aortic dissection on scene. Um, now, aside from your heart and your aorta and your vessels, you also have your uh, your lungs. So the lungs take up a very, very large portion of your chest cavity. And so this is going to be on your left lung. We're going to have uh, three lobes. Your right lung is actually going to have two lobes. And so, we're going to redact the previous 30 seconds because I definitely just misspoke. So, you also have your lungs, which occupy your thoracic cavity. So, for example, your, your left lung is actually going to contain two lobes. And it contains two lobes as it's trying to make room for your heart, so to speak. And your right lung, the, your heart isn't predominantly to the right, so it's actually going to have three lobes. So three lobes on the right, two lobes on the left. 
uh, the right side of your heart, your right atrium to your right ventricle, also contains your tricuspid. So if you want to think about it as you know, tricuspid has three points, uh, your right lung, as with the right side of your heart, contains three lobes. Um, Now, your diaphragm is going to be one of those things that is very, very important uh, to your chest cavity. So uh, your diaphragm actually attaches anteriorly, so to the front part of your chest, uh, at about the fifth or sixth intercostal space. So that's just below the nipple line. And as we breathe in, our diaphragm is going to descend as it allows room for air and as we in or exhale our diaphragm is going to ascend making our thoracic cavity actually smaller so if you have somebody that is uh, has a chest injury that is nipple line or below it can actually be considered both a thoracic trauma and abdominal trauma due to the diaphragm now posteriorly your um, your diaphragm connects to your ribs at about the twelfth, uh, the twelfth rib, and so um, your diaphragm is actually going to be uh, the primary muscle of breathing. So, and it's innervated by something that's called the phrenic nerve, and the phrenic nerve. It's really uh, it gets a lot of its. Your diaphragm is innervated by something called the phrenic nerve, and it, uh, your spinal column, it has these nerves that branch off of it in C3, C4, C5. Those are the vertebrae where uh, the spinal column of the spinal column, where if they get damaged, your diaphragm will actually stop and cease breathing. So, for example, if you have somebody that has a C3 fracture they can be completely awake, they can be paralyzed from the neck down and have an inability to breathe and due to the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles not being able to uh, contract and so if you leave this patient alone uh, they're going to die from uh, suffocation essentially uh, because their diaphragm is not going to be able to move but these patients can be, uh, be brought back they, they're going to go into a hypoxic arrest if they go down um, for this isolated reason. And these are your patients that you may see who, a couple years down the line, they're ventilator dependent, they're stuck at home on a vent, they're, their family will typically know how to take care of them. Um, so some of the primary functions of the, the thoracic cavity and its contents is going to be it deals with oxygen exchange and getting the oxygen and the other nutrients exactly where it needs to go so it's all about maintaining oxygenation and maintaining circulation uh, so your brain is going to help with all that because you have these chemoreceptors that are going to be located in the carotid sinus and the carotid arch and they're going to help regulate everything by based off your co2 so if your co2 gets too high uh, the receptors are going to send in a message to your brain telling your brain to say, hey, I need to breathe a little bit more or breathe a little faster because I'm having too much CO2, which is putting too little oxygen. Okay. Now, um, the intercostal and the accessory muscles, they pull the chest wall out and away from the center of the body as the diaphragm contracts downwards. And so whenever you Whenever you think of a muscle that's contracting, uh, you typically think of things getting smaller. But it's opposite in the chest, uh, if you want to look at it like that. So, for example, your, your diaphragm, whenever it contracts, it goes down. Whenever your intercostal muscles contract, they go out. Okay, And that is just all to help facilitate the negative pressure that is getting created inside of your chest uh, to be able to pull air in. Now, blood is going to be delivered to your body through your through your alveol or uh, through your circulatory system, and that blood is going to get oxygenated through 
the alveoli. The alveoli and the alveoli capillaries, all that, that takes place in the lungs. And that's actually going to be part of your external respiration because you have air that is being brought in from the outside and you have gas exchange right there at the alveoli. And uh, so whenever you have... So a big part of oxygenation is actually getting the oxygen down to the alveoli to begin with to be able to facilitate that gas exchange. Um, so, and that, that after that gas exchange, you have your blood vessels that will carry the oxygenated blood and carry those nutrients to wherever it is that they need to go. Now, so uh, you have ventilation, oxygenation, and respiration. So ventilation is going to be the physical movement of air in and out. Um, oxygenation is going to be the onloading of oxygen onto somebody. And then you have respiration, which is the actual exchange of the gases at the alveoli. So for example, your oxygen being brought in from the outside and us exhaling CO2. That is an example of respiration. Now, uh, for all this stuff to work, your heart has to be properly functioning as well. So, as blood is returning from the body, uh, so it's going to be deoxygenated. It gets pumped through the right atrium, to the right ventricle, to the lungs, where it goes through that alveoli process. Uh, it goes through your pulmonary vein, back to your left atrium, to your left ventricle, which gets pumped out. Uh, the blood gets pumped out to the rest of your body through your aorta. Um, and a big factor in this is going to be cardiac output. So if you have anything that's going to compromise that, it's compromising your cardiac output, which is compromising your ability to oxygenate, which is compromising the ability of cellular respiration, and is ultimately going to lead uh, to a state of hypoperfusion, potentially by hypoxia. And, and it's all about how you are managing that patient. We can cut the previous 10 seconds out. The big thing about cardiac output that you need to understand is it is measured by stroke volume times heart rate. Your stroke volume is how much is actually pumped out at one time, and your heart rate is your heart rate. How many times does your heart beat in that minute? So, for example, if you have somebody that has a heart rate of 100 and a stroke volume of 50, 50 milliliters, which means that at every time that their heart pumps, it's pumping out 50 milliliters. Okay, If you have somebody who has a heart rate of 100, that's actually going to put your cardiac output at 5,000 milliliters or 5 liters.